Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sigma 50mm 1.2 DG DN Art, a standard prime lens with a very bright f1.2 aperture. Launched in March 2024 and initially available in Sony E and Leica L mounts, it costs around 1400 US dollars or 1300 pounds. For comparison, their earlier 50mm 1.4 DG DN Art costs around $850 or pounds, so you're paying just over half as much again for roughly half a stop of extra aperture. That said, the new Sigma 51.2 is comfortably cheaper than other high-end standard prime lenses for either E or L mounts. For those with Sony bodies, it undercuts Sony's own 51.2 G Master, which typically costs around $2000 or pounds. This makes the Sigma 1.2 roughly two thirds the price of the Sony and actually closer to Sony's 1.4 G Master, which costs around $1,300 or £1,500. Meanwhile, for L mount owners, it also undercuts Panasonic's Lumix S Pro 50mm 1.4, which costs as much as $2,200 or pounds. Suffice it to say, we're not short of standard prime lenses from budget to high end, so let's now see how the latest Sigma performs. Measuring 81mm in diameter, 109mm long and weighing 745 grams, the Sigma 1.2 is noticeably more compact than their previous 35 1.2, which was wider at 88mm, longer at 137mm and much heavier at 1081 grams. But the real competition here is Sony's 51.2. Both lenses measure roughly the same length, but the Sigma is 6mm narrower and 33 grams lighter. This confirms Sigma's honesty when it describes the 51.2 as being the lightest in its class, but once in your hands, you're unlikely to notice that 33 gram difference. Bottom line, both of these lenses are impressively light and compact for their specification. Just compare them to Canon's RF 51.2 and especially Nikon's 50mm 1.2S, which tip the scales at 950 grams and 1084 grams respectively. Nikon's is also the longest of these four 1.2 lenses. If you're after a lighter 50mm lens without compromising on quality or aperture, Sigma and Sony's latest 1.4 models weigh 670 and 516 grams respectively. The Sigma 1.2 is made in their Japanese factory and like their other art lenses, it's very well built, featuring dust and splash proof construction, including a rubber grommet at the mount and a water and oil repellent coating on the front element. At the end of the barrel is a 72mm filter thread, the same as Sigma's 51.4 and Sony's 51.2, although Sony's 51.4 is a tad narrower and that allows slightly smaller 67mm filters. Sigma supplies a petal shaped lens hood which twists onto the end of the barrel. In contrast, Sony supplies their 50s with rubber tipped cylindrical hoods which allow you to stand them up more securely. Pushing a button on Sigma's hood unlocks it for removal and it's possible to also reverse it over the barrel for transportation, while a plastic cap keeps the front protected. Like other high-end lenses, a padded carrying case is also included. Starting at the mount end of the lens is a wide aperture ring which turns from f1.2 to f16 in one-third increments, with an A position at the end for body base control. Sandwiched between the aperture and the focusing rings are a switch for auto and manual focus a focus hold button, which may be programmable depending on your body, and a switch to de-click the aperture ring for silent adjustments. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the lens is a switch to lock the aperture ring to the A position. Like most autofocus mirrorless lenses, the manual focusing is by wire with the well-damped ring turning very smoothly. Sigma supplied me with the L-mount version for my review, which I tested on the Lumix S5 Mark II and 2X bodies, although most of my optical results equally apply to the Sony version. Now, due to a quirk of Lumix bodies though, the photo autofocus slows down when connected to an external HDMI recorder, which in turn makes it hard for me to demonstrate it in a review. But anecdotally, I found the autofocus speed for this lens fast and quiet in general use, with the lens and body snapping into focus, especially when set to continuous or AFC mode. I can, however, show you the video autofocus though, starting here with a single area focus pull between the bottle in the foreground and the wall behind it. This was filmed at f1.2, where the S5 2X is driving the lens nice and smoothly between subjects for video. I'd also say there's not much change in magnification here, so breathing hasn't become an issue in this situation. Switching to the full area with human face detection enabled, the lens and camera combination also easily kept me in focus at the maximum aperture as I moved around the frame. 
You'll also get an idea of the kind of blurring and separation as possible at these kind of portrait distances, and I'll be taking a closer look at portrait photo quality later in the review. I'd say the autofocus for photo and video is definitely good enough for day-to-day -day use, but if you're a Sony owner who's also into action and burst shooting, you should be aware that their latest and fastest bodies do limit their top burst speeds with third-party lenses, typically to around 10 frames per second. So if you want to exploit the fastest focus and bursts on a Sony body, you'll probably need to be using a Sony lens. Another feature that's not supported on third-party lenses on recent Sony bodies is compensation for focus breathing, where the view appears to zoom in or out a bit as you adjust the focus. Now, enabling compensation on these recent bodies crops the image to the worst case scenario, then cleverly maintains this field of view as you adjust the focus. It works pretty well in practice as long as you're willing to accommodate that crop. Perhaps in response to this though, Sigma claims to have reduced the focus breathing on the 51.2, so let's have a look. Here's a video I filmed on the S52X with the lens close to f16, and I'm manually focusing the lens from infinity to the closest distance of 40 centimeters and back again. You can see the view appear to magnify as I focus closer, a little like zooming a lens in a bit. Now in my test, the breathing on the Sigma 1.2 was certainly reduced compared to their 1.4 art, and it was also an improvement over the Sony 50 1.2 as you can see here. Now both of these 1.2 lenses also share the same minimum focusing distance of 40 centimeters, but again, if you're willing to accept a crop, the Sony lens will support breathing compensation on the latest bodies. That said, where the breathing is an issue in practice though depends on your subjects and expectations. It's only really a problem for videographers, and as you can see in my examples, it's not particularly visible across the shorter ranges in typical use. I personally feel focus breathing has become more of a talking point on YouTube reviews than an actual serious issue for the non-cinema lenses in general use, but do let me know in the comments what you think. Moving on, I wanted to share one more video demonstrating how the lens works with the built-in IBIS stabilization on the Lumix cameras. This clip was handheld with IBIS alone and the lens at f1.2, while a fixed autofocus area towards the left of the frame was positioned over the guitars. Now, third party lenses don't always work as well with the built in stabilization as the manufacturer's own lenses, but I was pretty happy with this result on the S52X. Okay, now for my photo quality test, starting with a distant real life landscape and the view angle so that details run right into the corners. I prefer to test lenses with real life subjects at both near and far distances as I feel it better reflects how a lens is going to perform than shooting a chart at close range. It is harder work to do, but I think it's worth the effort. Taking a closer look at the center of the image with the aperture wide open at f1.2 shows very crisp details. Stopping down the aperture a little bit brings fractional improvements to the ultimate sharpness, arguably peaking around f2 to 2.8, but I'd certainly be happy shooting this lens wide open for a subject near to the center. Now let's return to the version at f1.2 before heading into the far corner. Here you'll find a little darkening due to vignetting, as well as a slight reduction in the ultimate crispness, but as I gradually close the aperture, you'll see both of these improve and look pretty good by f2.8. In this series of shots, the lens was focused in the middle of the frame, but repeating them with the focus area moved right out into the far corner delivered pretty much the same result, proving that the lens has a nice flat field. Looking back at my landscape shots taken with the 50 1.2 G Master, I actually showed similar performance here overall, with the lens delivering similarly sharp detail in the middle when wide open, and only needing to be closed a stop or two to maximize the quality across the entire frame. Moving on to portraits, here's a shot taken with the Sigma 51.2, with the aperture wide open of course, and using face and eye detection on the Lumix S52X. Taking a closer look at my eyes, and sorry my wrinkles too, shows a tremendous amount of detail in those focused areas, while the very shallow depth of field has thrown the background nicely into blur, with a nice looking fall off that starts pretty much at my coat hood. Let's now put the Sigma lens on the left, my portrait from the Sony 51.2 on the right for a quick comparison. Now there's three years between these shots, not to mention using different cameras and under different conditions, but if you can look beyond all of that, you'll actually see similar rendering styles here. Not just the amount of blurring in the background, but how it falls off. For a closer examination of bokeh, it's time for my ornament test with a bunch of fairy lights in the background. Here's the Sigma 51.2 wide open and focused as close to the top of the ornament as I could. 
Now, even though the fairy lights aren't that far behind it, the large aperture has rendered them into satisfyingly large bokeh blobs, impressively bereft of onion ring textures within or undesirable outlining. So, a solid start. Let's now gradually close the aperture to see the effect of the diaphragm system, which is Sigma's first to use 13 blades. So to do it justice, I'm going to initially use the finest one third stops between f1.2 and f2, where you'll see the blobs become more uniformly round across the frame and minimal evidence of any geometric shapes. From f2 onwards, I'm going to switch to single stop increments. But again, you'll see those bokeh blobs remaining pretty well behaved and mostly circular in shape. Very impressive performance from the new Sigma. And even though they're three years apart and using different bodies, let's pop the Sigma on the left and the Sony on the right, both at f1.2 from a similar distance. Sure, the lights have been rearranged in that time, but again, the rendering style is pretty similar here. Switching them to versions where the apertures close a little reveals more of the impact of their respective diaphragm systems. Once again, 13 blades from the Sigma on the left versus 11 from the Sony on the right. And if you're really looking closely, you could argue that the blobs from the Sony sample are a tad more geometric with crisper edges, perhaps due to their distance, but I don't have a preference here, do you? So before wrapping up, one last test showing the Sigma 51.2 manually focused as close as it could to a ruler. Here I've managed to reproduce 195mm across the frame, and while there's very slight softness at the far edges, it does sharpen up nicely if you close the aperture a bit. Placing the Sigma sample at the top and the Sony at the bottom shows both lenses are actually capable of a very similar magnification. I measured around 200mm from the Sony, giving the Sigma here a very small benefit, but in real life terms, I'd rank them as similar in terms of close-up magnification and sharpness. Okay, now it's time for my final verdict, during which I'll show you a selection of images shot with the Sigma 50mm 1.2 DGDN Art. And as always, you can take a closer look on my review page for the lens at cameralabs.com. The Sigma 50mm 1.2 DGDN Art stands out amongst an enormous range of 50mm lenses by delivering excellent performance across the board, coupled with a very bright aperture that's packed into a surprisingly narrow, light, and competitively priced body. In my test, it was sharp for subjects near and far and very respectable right into the corners with only mild softness and vignetting in the extremes when wide open. If you can close it even just a stop or two, you'll enjoy a flat field with crisp results across the entire frame. Of course, you'll mostly want to shoot at f1.2 where it'll deliver attractive rendering with smooth roll off and large bokeh balls bereft of undesirable textures or outlining. In fact, two things really stood out for me during my tests. First, I didn't notice any undesirable artifacts, be it softened details, busy bokeh, chromatic aberrations, or pesky flare. It just calmly delivered excellent results without any fuss. Secondly, I was struck by how similar my results looked to the Sony 51.2 G Master, a doubly impressive feat since that's not only one of the best standard lenses out there, but Sigma's essentially matched it at two thirds the price while also shaving a few grams from the weight. As always though, Sony owners not only have a lot of choice at this focal length, but should also weigh up third-party lens restrictions. The focus breathing compensation and the fastest burst speeds on the latest Sony bodies are only supported with Sony's own lenses. And anecdotally, I also found that Sony stabilization is most effective with Sony's own lenses. But none of this may matter to you personally, and it's simply hard to ignore the price of Sigma's 51.2 art, and indeed the 1.4 art, which both comfortably undercut Sony's versions. For L-mount owners, it's an easy decision, with the lens slotting between Panasonic's 1.8 and 1.4 lenses on price, but becoming more compelling than either of them, at least for me personally. Bottom line, the 51.2R is a great lens at a competitive price, with Sigma being one of the strongest allies to both the E and L mount systems. I only wish that Canon and Nikon full framers could also enjoy these lenses. And that's it for my review. Let me know in the comments what you think, and in the absence of a sponsor for this video, you can always help me keep making more of them with a like and a follow. It's always very much appreciated. Or if you're feeling extra generous, you could treat me to a coffee or yourself to one of my Camera Labs t-shirts or my in-camera photography book. And there's links to everything along with the latest prices for the lens in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.